Hi friends! Welcome to another episode of Conversations with a Love Activist. This week we'll be talking to my very Christian mother about sex, her own journey towards self-love and self-acceptance and how she was able to then own her own pleasure and her own orgasm. We'll be demystifying um, the shame around sex and she'll be sharing with us what um, power she has gained from having autonomy over her own pleasure. So stay tuned as we go on this very, not as awkward as you would think, journey um, with my mom. This is the sex talk we all deserve to have with our parents. Stay tuned. It shouldn't be an unusual conversation that uh, mother and daughter are talking about sex. Um, but okay, because of uh, the kind of framework that we live in, it is an unusual conversation. <laughs> but I'm yes. so glad that I'm you are uh, open and that you reached out to say, this is something you, you want to talk about and this is something that you feel was in your heart and was important um, for you for you to discuss. So actually that's my, my first um, question is why was this, why was sex such an important thing to talk about? Like what happened? What did the Lord say? What did your spirit say about having to talk about and having to address sex? No, it's because we grew up in a culture where sex was not spoken about, where sex was a shameful thing. The only thing my mother said about sex when I was growing up is when I was going to high school. And that was her preparation for me that don't sleep with boys because you'll get pregnant. That was the only preparation that I had about sex. <laughs> uh, all our sex education we got from our peers, as we're growing up, who we were all curious about this sex thing, and uh, we're educating each other. It was the, before the time of the internet, <laughs> so we had <laughs> notebooks that were flying around with notes <laughs> on French kissing <laughs> and and all of that, and. Um, oh. So we would hide these notebooks at home so that our parents don't find them. And when my mother would come into my room and look in the drawer, I would freeze, thinking, she mustn't find the notebook. <laughs> yeah, that was the sum total of our sex education. Wait, That's so it. who created the notebook? Where did the notebook come from? <laughs> I mean, we were 11 years old. Tell me who actually created a notebook how do i even know who came up with a notebook who were just curious about sex and kissing and boys and we were so there were those who had these notes they probably got them from their older siblings i don't know but they were floating around we <laughs> all were participating in this drama <laughs> yeah oh, no. It was your version of the internet, actually. <laughs> exactly. It was our version of the internet. <laughs> what was your um, feeling around um, sex? You know, the fact that you guys had to create notebooks and have these kind of secret society of sex education uh, type situation. How did you guys know that this is not a subject that I can go to my mom and talk about and ask questions. When we were growing up, we used to call sex amanyala. So there, there would be kids who would be experimenting on sex and things like that. And our term used to be ubani no bani benza manyala. So you can imagine as 11 year olds, we used to regard sex as a shameful thing. Mm. So the, the Big uh, thing came when I went then to, to boarding school. Uh, remember, I was not prepared at all. So I get to this boarding school and there was bullying between uh, the, the form ones and the form trees. It, uh, the school went up to form three. So they were like the, 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 the top uh, grade in the school. So 
no, no, it went to grade, what would be now grade eight, eight. I think uh -huh. grade nine or something like that. Yes, grade nine. And you were going to so, grade? I would have been going to grade seven. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, then the, then this topic was hot now in, in, in boarding school. Mm -hmm. And um, and so these uh, older girls who would be bullying us, I, after the, 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 the doors are, are, are locked, so they would put us, uh, come to our dorm and, and they would then say, who are virgins here? And being a virgin was made out to be such a terrible thing mm. and then we would be lined up so those who are virgins will be lined out up and they would say all these horrible things to us and so it was made up to to be a a horrible thing you are like the lowest of the lowest if you are a virgin so again i mean you didn't have any Body to talk about this, you felt ashamed of your virginity, mm. and you are like the first opportunity I'm getting rid of this virginity thing. Mm. So, yeah, so I mean, are you surprised that I, I fell pregnant in 17? I got married early, and you can imagine now I know nothing about sex. For me, sex was a shameful thing as we were growing up. and. Now I have to fulfill my husband's needs around sex. Mm. And first of all, I have no clue about sex. And for me, sex is all about the man. And uh, my duty is to please this man uh, who's demanding this sex. I don't know my rights in, in this relationship. I know nothing about sex. Remember, there's no internet where you can even find out anything about sex. So I, I had this duty now of pleasing this man. Mm. And for me, then sex just turned into a traumatic thing. It became mm -hmm. literal tra trauma. Mm. Because first of all, I didn't enjoy this whole process. So imagine, unfortunately, my, my husband was a very selfish lover. So if we were sitting around in the lounge, and uh, chatting and all of that. When we, by the time we get to bed, uh, to the bedroom, he's already on. So as he's taking off his clothes, his pen is up and gets into bed. And it's like, let's get on with it. No preparation, no foreplay, nothing. So you can imagine sometimes you are just dry. So the whole penetration is painful. And, and so, and, 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 there was like um, sex for four days a week. And you don't know what is normal, what is not normal, but you just feel overwhelmed by this four days a week of this unpleasant sex in the first place. It's only later now when you read about sex that you found that actually four days a week was actually a lot. It was too much. So, so I had no rights. I didn't know that I could have demanded that I need to be prepared, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready right now. I need to be prepared. I, I, I believed that God created sex to punish women. I truly believed that. There is no other explanation to this. God created sex just to punish women. Ooh. And so even as young wives now, as we are you know, as when we're talking about sex, everybody was traumatized about sex. No one enjoyed sex. There, there were few women who enjoyed sex and those women were, were women who were cheating on their husbands. Mm. So again, I believed that uh, there were loose women. So only loose women uh, enjoyed sex. So uh, distant girls are not supposed to enjoy sex. You see, mm -hmm. it's loose women who enjoy sex. So it was normal not to enjoy sex. It was normal to live with this trauma of the sex. Yeah. It's really sad because sex is such a powerful energy, right? 
it's it's creation energy it's 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 where all our gifts sit mm. it's god energy and so to i wonder what it was about humanity that decided that sex must be this taboo thing is it because we're we were afraid of our power because sex is such a powerful energy and such a powerful force and i understand how communities would want to control sex because you can imagine too much sexual freedom would would add a burden to to the community of unwanted children who's going to take care of of these children and and i think they went to extremes and created this shame and this fear around sex because uh, of of trying to control uh, the the population so i suppose even the church then remember then we were we grew up as christians grew up in the church and again in the church from the bible there's a lot of control around the sex and mm. instruction around sex you know there should be no sex before marriage and 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 i suppose again communities were trying to manage population you know manage unwanted children and and things like that which is why children who were born out of wedlock had no rights uh, with their father and and all of that i mean terrible things that are really oppressive mm. and and depriving children of a relationship with with their with their father for instance so i think it got out of control so when you finally then um decided to to leave the marriage and now you're a single woman um out in the world what what was that experience then like of having to face the dating world one of uh, the, the reasons why i i uh, sort of the, the i first tracked the decision to leave my 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 husband was because now I was talking to my mom one day and she was telling me how my father at 70 still wanted sex. It was just in that context that they were, they were having sex. I was so shocked. I was like, what? You're still having sex? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, yes. So... I thought, what? I thought this thing ends at 40 or something like that, you know? <laughs> oh, at this time, I'm 30 something. I'm like, another 40 years of this trauma? Never. <laughs> Never. I am not going to go to another yeah. 40 years of this trauma. So it was one of those decisions of, no, I have to end this trauma. So you can imagine, I, I... So I end a marriage and sex is a big reason why I'm, I'm also ending this marriage, including other aspects of the marriage that I was unhappy about. Fortunately for me, my first boyfriend after, after marriage then is the one who taught me about sex. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that he must have been taught about sex by some older white woman. <laughs> so but I, I'm very clear. <laughs> So some of the, so for the first time, I found that first of all, this preparation, oh, I can be prepared. This man <laughs> makes sure that I am prepared. He would let me take a long bath so that I relax. He would give me a massage so that I relax. He really loved sex. So, so that I relax and, um, and sex, this, Sex itself was a, a, a beautiful experience that I also enjoyed. Afterwards, he would put me on, on his chest until I sleep, mm -hmm. like that. So, so for the first time, I knew that sex is something that could be enjoyed. And, and, uh, and I'm always grateful to him, actually. I mean, the relationship didn't last because... Uh, we were both just broken vessels, the, the two of us, we were just broken people. So I was just coming out of a divorce. He, he was also just broken. And again, I mean, we're never going to have healthy relationships 
until we deal with our brokenness. So let's talk about this this thing of umfazi abegezela because I I know that that was also a big driver of enduring this traumatic sexual relationship with with my dad. You know, what is that and how can we put an end to it? Because it, it's also now marketed as, you know, umpokoto, the woman's strength is in how much she can endure. The woman holds the sharp end of the knife, all that nonsense that we get, get fed and then um, forces us or makes us feel like we have to stay in situations that are just horrible. What was your biggest motivation of I can't leave? Why did it take 17 years to, to take ownership for your happiness? We grew up in a society where we, we didn't know anybody who was happily married, right? Our parents, our mothers, right? And, and they used to tell us that they are doing it for us. A woman may has to, to make a zella for the, for the children. Mm-hmm. And my mother-in-law was my mentor in this whole marriage thing. So she used to tell me constantly that a woman is there to serve her husband, serve her husband's family and, and her children. Love and happiness are not part of the deal. So you just have to persevere for the sake of the children. And that was the traditional understanding of the role of a wife and the role of marriage. And I believed it. I accepted what tradition told me until I realized that, but these are my mother-in-law's choices. She's the one who made these choices for herself. Mm -hmm. And so I I don't have to make them my own choices. I am free to make my own choices. Also, I'm independent. I'm able to support myself. It's not because sometimes women used to persevere because the man was the only one working. Mm. So I can support myself, I can support my children. And, 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 and I must say, I also don't want to blame um, my, my husband. We're both just broken people. You know, she, he was broken, I was broken. And so there was just no way that we could ever have had a healthy love, love relationship be, between the two of us without attending to, to our healing. So first of all, there was no education around the purpose of marriage. Mm-hmm. We got married when we were young. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't had, we didn't have a vision for, for the marriage. We didn't know anything about a happy marriage because there was no concept in the African culture of a happy marriage. Mm-hmm. No concept, you know? So you're sort of looking for something that didn't exist, mm-hmm. but at least you came to a place of saying, no bakutwani. I'm no longer prepared to do this thing unhappy, even for my children. We we come into relationships with our brokenness. Mm -hmm. And and a marriage, I suppose, is an opportunity for healing of our brokenness. But because we didn't have any spiritual education uh, around how we could heal ourselves, we're not even aware we were broken, really, to be Mm -hmm. honest. I had an issue with him. He had an issue with me and he was the problem and he probably thought I was the problem. So if he could change, then we would be happy. Mm. I never even thought that I had a role to play in terms of dealing with my own brokenness, mm. you know? And unfortunately, even back then, there was no information. And, and you, you are lucky because you're living in an era where there's so much education, there's so much teaching around uh, all of these subjects, including the, the, the sex subject. That's why it is said for me that if young people of your age are still, still don't fully know their, their rights, they think they still think that they are there to please the, hus- the, the, the boyfriend or the husband, and they have to be beautiful for this, uh, for this man. I mean, how we still see our bodies as shameful mm. and how we feel guilty around sexual freedom because we don't think we're allowed um, sexual freedom. Whatever that means, I again 
don't want to say sex doesn't come with responsibility. Mm. But this whole notion of we hate our bodies as women because we, we, we've been taught that our bodies are there to please a man. So, and again, we project these things on, on the men. I mean, I don't know, my ex-husband, for instance, after the children, I was fat and all of that. He never complained about my weight. My weight was never an issue for him. <laughs> but we, <laughs> but we, we are shameful of our bodies because we think that we have to be beautiful for, for this man. And, um, and again, sex is still a shameful thing that it's either you are in on the extreme mm. or, or both extremes around sex, mm. without sex without responsibility, or again, you know, feeling that you are there to be used by, by a man. And um, I think it's getting even more complicated now with this expectation that I will give you sex if you'll support me financially and things mm. like that. So things are getting, you know, worse and worse and worse. And, and that's why I was prepared to, to have this conversation with you because I'm like, we suffered as black women, especially around this sex issue. We don't want our children to, to continue to, to suffer. And also, I mean, there, there are many married women who may still be suffering as I used to suffer, you know, around this, this subject of sex where uh, women do not understand that their bodies belong to them. First of all, your body is given to you to carry your soul here on this realm. That is its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is to carry your soul not to please the man. Mm. And when you hate, when we hate your body, you are hating yourself because your, your body is, is a big part of who you are. Mm. And, and I don't want us to also do this, you know, we're talking so much about self-love, even um, your own initiative is all about sex and um, self-love. But that, let's not even make it a cliche that I love myself, I love my body. You need to know why do you love your body? Mm. You love your body because it carries your soul. You love your body because it carries these amazing tasks for you mm. selflessly, effortlessly mm. every day. We only realize how precious our bodies are when we're sick. You know, when mm. we're sick and we can't even get out of bed, that's when you realize how precious your body is. And when you get well, you get you continue to take your body okay. uh, for granted until you have a major illness that maybe sobers you up around not just your body, but life as well. So let's, let's love ourselves. Let's love our bodies as women. Let's understand how precious our bodies are. Let's understand our bodies. I mean, I remember that Oprah is the one who started to talk openly about sex and, and our bodies. There was a talk, I think there was a, someone who she was interviewing, talking about the vagina and talking about the clitoris and all of those things. And she was saying, do you even know your vagina? And I realized that I'd never looked at my vagina. Mm. I had never looked at my vagina. And it took me a long time to even have the courage to take a mirror and look at my vagina. Mm. Because again, mm. I was still carrying this whole belief of how shameful my body is, how shameful my, my vagina is. So I went, I, I looked on the internet, the whole anatomy of the vagina and all of that, just so that I could understand my own body mm. and love my own body and appreciate my vagina and look at it with love that it, it is my vagina. It gave birth to my children mm. and, and all these wonderful miracles that our bodies do for us that we take for granted. And what must look good, first of all, for us, mm. then other people can benefit mm. from that. So it, it, it just adds to this whole trauma of trying to please this man. Mm. And so when we don't know who we are, when we, are, we don't believe we're worthy of love, I never believed I was worthy of love because of my own brokenness, 
So I, I, I accepted the treatment that I had from my ex-husband because I never believed that I was worthy of love because of my brokenness. Even afterwards, I attracted men who treated me the same way because again, until I loved myself, until I understood that I was worthy of love, I was worthy of having a relationship where there would be love and mutual respect between the, the two of us. I, I, I attracted the same kind of men. That's why women attract the same kind of men who would abuse them over and over again. Uh, so it has to start with us loving ourselves. Mm -hmm. It has to start with us focusing on our own healing, taking that journey seriously of inner healing. Then you are in a position to love someone else. How can you love someone else when you don't even love yourself? I didn't love myself. I didn't think I was worthy of love. So I can't even blame my ex because I didn't love myself. I didn't believe I was worthy of love, which is why I got the kind of treatment I got from him. I mean, how are we supposed to love ourselves when there's phrases like, you, Lentombazania's tanda, you, Haila Subtenes tanda ranje, you know, where loving yourself is synonymous with either promiscuity, um, rudeness, um, coldness, um, basically it, it, it almost becomes a reason for your rejection. Like we are rejecting you because you love yourself. And so obviously because we are human beings and we crave connection with other human beings, we see, we start to see self-love as a barrier to connection. And so it's like, I don't want to be rejected like that girl is being rejected. And so I will I will say, you know, I'll be a sacrificial lamb. I will go with what the flow of the community is. And, you know, there's something that I, I, I've noticed and that we never really talk about um, where because, because I have mega zealot and I have suffered, why do you think you have the right to go be happy? You going out to go be happy is making my decision to stay and suffer wrong. You're saying... With your happiness, you're saying, I was wrong to stay. I was wrong to endure. I was wrong, and I don't want to be wrong. So I will peddle the lies of Begazelan so that we can be right. You know, the ego wants to be right more than it wants to be happy. And so as a society, we may not realize it as women that we are oppressing each other because we just, we don't want to be right. We don't want to be wrong. And we don't want to give a reason for being rejected. And so if I get, it's like peer pressure, basically. If I get others, if I normalize the suffering that has been normalized before me and before me and before me, then it means I was right. It means I have value. It means um, I'm seen in some way um, in my rightness. You know, so I just thought that that's something important. Um, you know, the fact that you 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 had the the awareness to go, but that's my mother-in-law's decision. That's the life she has chosen. I want something different for myself. A lot of women don't have the courage, capacity, awareness to know that they can decide for themselves. We we've been taught to love others. You know. Let's sacrifice for others. Let's love others. Let's give to others. Let's give to our children. Let's give to friends. Let's give to boyfriends. So the whole idea of it's selfish to love yourself, to take care of yourself, to put yourself first. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is that who can be happy around you when you don't love yourself? So it is not selfish to put your first, yourself first. It is not selfish to love yourself. It is actually, um, you, you are the, not the only one who benefits because then you have healthy relationships and everybody around you will be happy when you, when you love yourself. And, and so as we talk about you know, human, ra human rights uh, and gender equality and things like that, it has to start with women taking responsibility for themselves and loving and accepting themselves because it seems like God made a mistake when he made women and were here 
to just serve and give and be taken for granted. And I think that will stop when we start to appreciate our own value and appreciate our own worth that women are the ones who raise these powerful people who are out there, who are doing big things. You know, without women, there would be no world leaders in, mm-hmm. in any sphere. We need to appreciate our own value as women so that even when we walk into love relationships, when we walk uh, in, the, in the workplace, we understand fully that our worth and, and move from our own authentic power. Mm-hmm. I think it is time mm-hmm. that women um, are allowed to be themselves and it's going to be a journey to find who we are because we've always been defined by others, you know, mm. we've been defined by society, who we are, our role in society and all of that. We, we've not taken the, the time to find out who we are and how do we want to navigate life in this society? How do we want to contribute to society? Now that you are on this journey, Um, Talk to me about the, the, you know, you started looking at, at, you know, your own body and your vagina. When the word orgasm, when did you hear it? When did you have it? What was your first thoughts about the word orgasm? Because it's still a big issue, even for me and my own sexual journey. You know, if I... I, I, I approach something like masturbation as something to get it over and done with. There's, I still have a lot of shame when it comes to my own body and my own pleasure. You know, I don't fully have ownership of my own pleasure. And it's something that I'm working on with, with Gogo, you know, with the womb mapping and everything. So it, it, it's still an issue that we as young people are, are, are having in terms of having ownership of our own pleasure. So can you talk to me around the word orgasm? <laughs> orgasm is, again, we were there for this man's pleasure. You knew a man's orgasm. Mm. You know, you felt it in your body when he, he has an orgasm and you, you felt like You've, you've served the man mm. when he has his pleasure and he has his orgasm. He never cared about my orgasm. He never cared whether I had an orgasm or not. I didn't even know how an orgasm is. I mean, even in that relationship I'm talking about where for the first time I enjoyed sex, do I remember my orgasm? No, it was always his pleasure. It was always his orgasm, you know? So again... We, we, because we never thought we were supposed to enjoy sex. We never thought it was important for us to have orgasm. All we knew was that very few women are able to have an orgasm. So we, we, we do need to take away this shame around sex. I mean, I, I, I used to remember that, that my, my ex would have, would masturbate uh, those days when, for instance, I, I, I mean, this four days a week, so those two days, you probably, you just have a, a masturbation in the bed. And I used to feel so bad, mm. you know, when he did that, because again, for me, it was like, I'm not fulfilling my duty that he has to, uh, to resort to that. Mm. Again, we saw masturbation as shameful and evil, you know. Mm. Okay, I didn't... Uh, I didn't, I didn't think it was evil at the time. I think it was after the church that we were taught that sex before marriage and, and, and masturbation is, is evil. And I, again, I suppose it was all around this education of if you masturbate and you find the pleasure in masturbation, we are going to want the real thing. And again, we want to control sex. So don't mm-hmm. masturbate so that you don't end up having sex. Uh, I think it was all about that. I don't profess to know what is right, what is wrong, what you know, but I strongly believe that God gave us sex as a, as a, a for pleasure as, as well. No one can give me permission to, to enjoy sex and have pleasure. And I began to understand as I was understanding the soul of 
thing of my own freedom, including my own sexual freedom, including freedom over my own body. Then, then I realized, I started to question this teaching of the church that masturbation is evil because I must wait for a man before I, and get married before I could have sex. And, and I've been divorced 27 years now. You can imagine. <laughs> which God, which God then would expect me to wait for 27 years mm-hmm. and wait for a man for me to enjoy sex, you know? So, so at some point then I explored with masturbation and I experienced orgasm for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I then realized that men's orgasm is so quick, for instance, it's, it's few seconds blow. My orgasm can take longer because I can, I can enjoy it for longer. It keeps giving and giving and mm-hmm. giving and giving. The, the, the greatest feeling in the world, I don't think there is, besides loving your children or something like that. I mean, second to that, is the greatest feeling in the world. Mm. And women are deprived of this feeling because, because our, our, our sensitive parts are outside the vagina. Mm. Uh, in the clitoris or whatever. So that's why most women don't end up not, not ever experiencing orgasm. So unless we have a partner who is sensitive to, to, to that understanding, who would um, give you that pleasure, you know, mm-hmm. and make sure that you also have that pleasure through um, uh, playing with your, with your vagina outside the sex itself. So there has to be those understanding that I deserve pleasure also. I deserve to enjoy my orgasm. You have to help me through. I help you get you your, your orgasm. You have to help me get mine as well. Mm. Um, let's play around with this thing and let's have this freedom. Um, we have to take away this shame. You know, we must look at our bodies in the mirror and, and, and look at ourselves even as older women. I'm no longer the pretty 34 year old mm. I was when I divorced. But I look at myself in the mirror and I say, I love my 60 year old body. You know, um, you, you are wise, you, you are still functioning. You know, I still wake up in the morning and just love myself and love my 60 year old body. And um, let's look at our vaginas and, and say, wow, I mean, you are a miracle. You give me the greatest pleasure in a way that I don't even understand. <laughs> you know, pleasure that goes through to your toes. Kind of <laughs> and you're ashamed of, 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 of that feeling. God gave this thing as a gift. Yes, it comes with responsibility. And yes, there's, um, there is abuse out there. And yes, you shouldn't make your body available to people who don't even love or respect you. I believe mm-hmm. that sex should happen in a loving relationship where there's self-love of both parties mm. and love and respect for, for one another. Don't uh, do the same thing that we did. Talk openly to your children around sex because they talk among themselves anyway mm. uh, around sex. So you are just being fools if you don't openly talk to them around sex and educate them about self-love. And, and of course, I mean, there are people who are out there ready to abuse our children prepare them to, to protect themselves from, from people like that. But in, in our own communities, in our own houses, let's, let's demystify mm. this issue of sex and let's start to receive this great gift that God gave to us. That yes, does these wonders of giving birth to children, but also I believe strongly that sex was to be enjoyed. So if you don't know your own body, if you can't give yourself pleasure, how can you expect someone else to give you pleasure? Mm-hmm. For me, it just didn't make sense that I would wait for someone to give me pleasure. Now I know how to give myself pleasure. And we can't outsource our pleasure, right? Just like the Bible says, mm-hmm. love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because... You can't give what you don't have. So you can't expect someone to navigate your body 
the, that you don't have mm -hmm. a map to. You yourself, don't, you do not have the map to that body. Yeah. I mean, I always say yes. as much as yes, it's still a journey for me to really come into full embrace. You know, Ugogo is teaching me how to speak to my yoni, that my, my yoni has a voice. And I need to speak to her in a way that is loving, in a way that is kind. I need to apologize for the situations I put her that she did not want to be in, you know, for the decisions yeah. I made on her behalf without her yeah. consent, you know, and that is the process I'm going mm -hmm. through. But I always say that why would God put a clitoris doesn't have a biological purpose. It doesn't have a, a a biological reason for existing. Why would you mm. put 6,000, there are 6,000 nerve endings in the clitoris. There's mm. no body, there's no object, or there's no part of the body in men or women that have that much concentration of nerves. And its only mm. reason of existing is for pleasure? Mm. Why would only. God do that? Only. Why would God do no, that? No, you don't pee with it, you don't Give birth, literally has no if you cut it off, your body people. functions with <laughs> continues to function as normal, you know, except for yes, of course, it, it then the um thing is your libido, which affects many things. But what I'm saying is, why would God go through the trouble of literally surgically putting 6,000 of them for them to be enjoyed by someone else? doesn't make any sense but okay anyway um mama thank you so so much I, I think this was such an important conversation to have um you know as you know we are on this journey of of self-love and the best protection for our children is for them to learn how to love themselves because of the because uh, of the a lot of the times or oh, for me, before I went on this journey, 100% of the times when I reached out um, in a romantic relationship, I was looking for people to fulfill jobs that were mine. I wanted them to love me the way I was supposed to be loving myself. You know, so if we can teach our children that you lack nothing, the thing that you're looking for, you have. It will avoid them carelessly, unconsciously, letting people into their lives both boys and girls both need this education both you know it's not taught self-love is not talked about in the context of men it, it's not yeah. something mm. it's assumed that men love themselves but men are as repressed as we are they're not allowed to show how they express their emotions about mm. a man is like this a man is like that so both parties both of us are uh repressed and oppressed you know and both of us need healing um in this area and if our children have that awareness that you're dealing with a soul you're not just you're not dealing with someone who's here for for your pleasure and who's here for for your comfort and is not here for just for for your relief this is a soul who has a purpose and so when you're getting into any kind of relationship you have that that awareness and that sanctity of what you're doing I think can really help our children navigate the space much, much better and not allow them to give away their power to people as easily as we thought we had to. Yeah, that, that's all we can do is, is walk this journey and love ourselves. And you're right, the beneficiaries of us loving ourselves are our, our husbands and our children. It's what Quentin you know, we had a conversation, a very serious conversation about having the second baby. And he's been resistant for many years. And he said, you know, he's so at peace at, about it. And I asked him, where did this peace come from? And he's like, from watching you fight for your life. Watching you fight to love yourself gave me so much peace that I knew that I can, I can depend on you you've set a precedent in this household that we fight for loving ourselves. And that's what now I want to do myself as a Quentin. I want to cover my own journey of self-love and healing because I watched you do it. And you opened up the space for, for, for me to do it. I knew that I, I, I wouldn't be judged for expressing my emotions, for 
going into myself and I knew that there's space for, for me to do that because I watched you fight for yourself and do it. So yeah, this, this, this work is, it, it, it has a ripple effect. Like who passed that says, you know, in, in a marriage, in a, in a romantic relationship, you're building um, generational momentum for prosperity. That's what you're doing by healing each other and healing yourselves. It creates the momentum so that oh 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 my you don't have to have these conversations. They can have higher level conversations. For me, it was really about freedom. We have to find healing. We have got to, to find freedom. We we are here to live and enjoy our lives. As soon as I I just removed myself as a, my mother's daughter and. I saw my mom as a sister, as a, as a, an, a woman, as a friend. Um, it's where our relationship really, really started to heal. And that's why we can have these kind of very important, critical conversations. And I hope that that has given you guys the freedom to start taking autonomy for your pleasure. You know, um, orgasms, sex, that's God energy, that's creation energy. We cannot outsource that to other people. And even though, yes, now myself, I'm still on this journey and I'm still um, building a relationship with my own yoni and my own um, sacred energy and my own, own sexuality, um, at least I'm on the journey, I'm, at least I'm on the path. And there's so many of us who don't even realize that our, our yoni has a voice and that we've been muffling um, or, or stifling the voice of Ioni to, to guide us, to help us create bigger, more inspired lives. So I'll leave you with that, my friends. Bye.